Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Beyond 22 Feet Basketball Podcast. My name is Terrence Oglesby. I have Fax and Childress coming around here in a minute. He's going to go sit in his seat, but we've got a pretty good show. A week off for Clemson. However, big game against Georgia Tech. Need a little revenge, and it's a mega game as far as ACC standings are concerned. We talk, we're going to talk a little bit about Clemson's future schedule past tomorrow, as well as some other games uh, around the ACC. Not to mention... Faxon's Player of the Week, that always goes well. And then on top of that, going to look ahead to Georgia Tech. We're going to draw some things up on the board. Nothing too complicated, just a little something, something as we go full forward. But my man Faxon just sat down. Hopefully his microphone's working. Faxon, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic. And uh, let us know, obviously, if there's any audio issues. But I'm doing fantastic. I'm excited to talk about some Clemson basketball. Got a big game tomorrow. Got to go get a win tomorrow. Huge tomorrow. Oh, they're six and five in conference. Clemson's looking to go seven and five against a very good Georgia Tech team that just played yesterday. Jose Alvarado, best player on the team, played all 40 minutes guarding Sam Hauser, probably, if not the ACC player of the year, one of them. So he's going to be tired. Five players for Georgia Tech played above 32 minutes. That should be interesting enough. Just to try to get their legs going. Look for Clemson to try to do their best to turn up the pressure and do some other things like that. But before we get to that, Clemson had a big win against Syracuse. Syracuse is 2-3 zone. There are some long bodies in that zone, and they have a lot of good players offensively, and they present some different challenges this year as opposed to years past. Dolajai, as good as he's been, they really held him in check. Why? Because Amir Sims and other five men that the Tigers threw at him did a nice job of keeping him in front and keeping their teammates out of help situations. Worked out really well for the Tigers so far. And not to mention, Brother Clyde Trapp did an excellent job. Didn't score a ton, only four points on the night, but 11 assists, eight rebounds, did a little bit of everything for the Tigers on a night where they really needed him, Faxon. 11 dimes for Clyde, like you said, eight boards. He played fantastic. And I saw a statistic from the Clemson men's basketball account that said Clyde is the second player in the Brownell era to register 11 assists in a game. It's him and Marquise Reed, so he's definitely in some elite company there. This was a great win for the Tigers, and I think that they're returning to form uh, from what we were used to in the first 10 games, and I'm very excited going forward about the team. Yeah, not, a, not only was Clyde really good, but Omax Prosper, I thought, gave some really good minutes, and he was even better when I went back and looked at him again, his effort was excellent, and he's figured out, Faxon, that if he only plays 12 to 15 minutes, he can empty the tank. And boy, did he play hard. He ran the floor really well. He finished around the basket and played really physical. It was a group effort. There's no doubt. P.J. Hall got some minutes, played really well, and Nick Honor really spurred the Tigers on from the beginning. Yes, and Omax Prosper, I mean, when you talk about someone that's making the most of their opportunity, this dude's giving it 100%. Like you said, he's emptying the tank every time he's out there. And... I just really have to commend him for his effort on the offensive boards. He crashes the glass better than anyone else on the Tigers. And you can tell how much he wants. You can tell how much he loves playing for Brad and playing for his guys. So, you know, hopefully he's winning himself some more minutes because I personally love having someone out there that's always going to be given 100%. And they started Nick Honor, which I thought was a unique choice. Why? Because you're playing against Syracuse's 2-3 zone. You need that spurt ability at the point guard position. I don't know if somebody's upset at Alamir Dawes or not, but Nick Honor, what a, what a great player to be able to plug into your starting lineup alongside Alex Hemingway and give yourself some shooters, not only around the perimeter, but Jonathan Bear hit some big shots right around the middle. Amir Sims was as good as usual. I feel like we forget to talk about Amir sometimes because he's been so spectacular all season. But Clemson, because Nick Honor came in, hit four threes in the first half, and some of them were deep we're able to play with a lot of confidence pretty much the entire game. Yes, and this was definitely the Tigers' best shooting game of the season when you look at complete performance, offensive performance. Obviously, shot the ball pretty well against Georgia Tech, but 20 turnovers. Did a good job keeping, uh, taking care of the ball in this game. Shot 44% from deep almost, 10 for 23. Everyone on the team shot the ball well. Like you said, Nick pulled up for the parking lot on one of those like from the, from the hash. Like I saw Brad throw his hands up on the sideline when the shot went up, and it just dropped. And you saw Nick. He was getting full court. He was clapping in the guy's face. And uh, I think Beheim might have called a timeout. But it was definitely a great environment in Little John. And Nick Honor, in my opinion, needs to continue to start because – Clemson struggles early in games sometimes, but I feel like when you have his energy on both ends of the floor and his fearlessness to take shots, it can kind of alleviate some of that laziness that we've seen at the beginning of the game from the Tigers at, at times. Well, it gives you that spurt ability from the beginning. And Alamir Dawes, whenever he does come off the bench, he gives you that same kind of yep. energy uh, to carry through the entire game. But there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about because the last few games when the Tigers have been playing well, they've been pa passing the ball extremely well. Clyde Trapp was putting it on the numbers all game, and it resulted in a lot of easy shots. 
shots for his teammates, and he was probably the lone guy for the Tigers that did a nice job of getting downhill past that first line of defense. You can always throw it into the high post, but whenever you're able to penetrate the gaps along the side, right at the 45 degree mark, which is right around here, it'll change some things for your offense, and they, they collapse towards the ball. Clyde knew that, was able to find some shooters, and he was excellent. Here's a possession to start out that I wanted to show. And now obviously, the Tigers are trying to move the ball. Why are they moving the ball so much? It drives you crazy, I think, sometimes, where all you hear is, move it, move it, doesn't it, Pax? Yeah, you can hear Brad yelling at him. He's yelling the whole time. The reason he's yelling, move it. Why? Look at the top of the zone. This is Joe Girard. He's yelling, move it, because he wants those top guys to shift, creating some penetration opportunities. So what happens? That ball's moving, gets back to Clyde, shot fake, and you're taking Bayheim, who's the bottom guy, out. You're taking Gerard, an extra help guy, and he sees a wide open Alex Hemingway in the corner. Alex doesn't hit this shot, but look where the ball is. He catches it right here. That hasn't been the case throughout the season, Paxson, and Clyde did an excellent job. Yeah, and you can tell, like you know, like you were saying, Brad's telling him to move it, move it, shifting the guards, and Dolajai is in no man's land there at the bottom of the zone, if you want to look at the bottom, because it's either... Do I concede an open layup to Amir Sims, or do I let arguably the best shooter on the team wide open for corner three? So this is a great possession by the Tigers, like you said. I felt like they could have probably had 85 to 90 points in this game. Missed a lot of open shots still, even with their good percentages. But just really more indicative of how well prepared they were for the Syracuse zone, how well prepared they were for this game, and Clyde's senior leadership was put on full display. And it's, it's not worth forgetting that Alan Griffin leads that team in shot blocks. A lot of it's in situations like this where he's able to close out because he's got really long arms. So they've got athletes to get out there and contest. But when you put it and you're not having to gather and then shoot, it makes a significant difference. As you can see, Hemingway misses this one, but it puts Amir in good position to get a rebound. Next possession, here's, you're going to see another time by Clyde. They have some movement. They're trying to move it, trying to move it. Look at the defense shift. One. Look at all this gap here. You have Gary A down at the bottom. You have Buddy Bayheim. It's going to go honor to Trap. Trap's going to penetrate, and you're going to see the result. And because he has a bad closeout, Clyde has all this space to operate. He's going to see Amir. He's the alone guy who is able to get there without help. For the most part, Clyde, he's been able to play off guys, but whenever he's aggressive in playmaking and he's strong with the ball, you're going to get possessions like this. An excellent play by Clyde. Just to show a couple of more, I was just so impressed and I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about this play real quick. So this is an interesting baseline out of bounds, and I wanted to show it as fast as possible. Because Syracuse likes to put a guy down here in the corner, they cross these forwards, and what happens? Amir goes and screens the top guy. Hunter Tyson goes down here and occupies the middle guy and leaves Alex Hemingway, your shooter, wide open for a shot. See, look how perfect this pass is for an open Alex Hemingway. Right on the, well, it was a little high, but still he's stepping into it. He's not having to work too hard to get the shot. Sets his feet. Forget about it. Bang. He had to talk a little bit about it, too, after the fact. This was probably my favorite possession of the game because the ball moved, and it was an excellent gap attack. When I say gap attack, you'll notice Syracuse, this is a 2-3. It looks like a 4-1, right? So you have the bottom wings that are sneaking higher because Beheim believes that his, his bottom wings are athletic enough to cover a lot of ground, correct? So what happens? You've got to find a way to flatten them out. This is how that works. You put a guy on the baseline, they're going to have to start going back down. A little bit in no man's land. You're going to have to move the ball. You're trying to shift the defense. Look at him away. As soon as he gets down in the corner, they know he's there. Excellent gap attack. Dolajai's in the middle. Griffin all over, what's the word? Overcommits. Overcommits to the ball. Thank you. And you're finding in right open Alex Hemingway in the corner. And it was a perfect pass. That's the kind of play that the Tigers are going to need going forward. Especially, Tigers have shooters. They're only shooting 31% from the three. But at the same time, they haven't been great passers. If they're better passers, they're going to shoot better percentage. You said 10 of 23? 10 of 23 from deep. What is that? What is that percentage? What's it's that? Uh, around 44%. I mean, if, if Tigers shoot 44%, they're going to beat a lot of teams because they defend so well. If they, if they shoot 44%, I don't know who's going to beat that, that, there, There's a strong case for what you're saying. But because those passes are perfect, Alamir Dawes got a couple like that. Nick Honor obviously did too. But passer makes the shooter. Clyde Trapp shows you evidence of that pretty much the entire game. And one more guy. 
I had a couple of bad clips, and I felt bad because I didn't get the right ones. But how about Omax Prosper? Look, you're saving the ball out of bounds. Excellent hustle by Amir. Watch number 10 run the floor. This is a freshman trying to get minutes. You're up 21 points with two and a half minutes to go. A lot of guys are walking it up. Not Omax. Watch him run the floor. Number 10 in this possession gets a little tangled up, runs right past the defense. Last few minutes, some shifty ball handling. And boy, was he good. Boy, was he good. I mean, it, there wasn't a whole lot to complain about, Fax. And this was a team win. They had a lot of different guys score, and they really got back. They're back to defending the way they were at the beginning of the year. Yeah, and Omax Prosper, you were talking about uh, attacking the baseline to kind of manipulate that zone uh, to create more space underneath. And I felt like Omax Prosper did a great job of that all night as well. When you look at the film, you could hear Brad, and it was good coaching. Every time you see those wings extend up, you could be going Omax or Alex. You'd be going baseline, baseline, baseline. And there were a couple times where Omax received the ball down there, made a good pass, and they were able to swing it around and get an open shot. So I think he personally, in my opinion, earned himself some more minutes with this performance against Syracuse. Well, you got to look, look at the players that, that Brad has on the floor most of the time. Guys that don't necessarily get downhill by themselves. Alamir Dawes can do it a little bit. Clyde Trapp can do it a little bit. How do you combat that? You create ball movement. You cre create defensive movement on the front line. That's what they were able to do against Syracuse's zone. That's what they try to do in man as well, but you have to do it in different ways, obviously. You have to create that movement so guys can get downhill, and you try to create long closeouts, and those result in assist opportunities and, and things of that nature. I really like the way this Tiger team is playing right now. Goodness gracious, though, you have to stay healthy. Yeah, you definitely do. And I wanted to personally just go off on a tangent about Hunter Tyson, seven minutes, played one in the second half, I'm pretty sure, after mm -hmm. having arguably his best game of the season. Do you think that was more of a fit thing against the zone, or was Omax playing such good minutes that you just didn't want to take him off the floor? It was three turnovers in the first four minutes of the game. Yeah. That's what did it. You could tell, you could tell he was uncomfortable along the baseline, and that's where they needed him to be successful was along the baseline. He was trying to drive into traffic. He wasn't following game plan because whenever you play Syracuse, you better have a solid decision once you catch that ball, and you need to be decisive right away. Yeah. Because if you, let, if you sit and you're apprehensive about what you're going to do next, Syracuse is going to swallow you up because there's too much length around those bottom lines. And you saw it when Hunter was, was turning the ball over, but running into big bodies, falling out of bounds, trying to get rid of it. Three turnovers in three and a half minutes. How many turnovers did he have in the whole game? He had three. He had three. They were all consecutive. Consecutive. Can't have that, especially when you're as deep as you are. So you roll with a hot hand. Is that, does yep, that answer your question? I definitely question? agree. Yeah, he, he just struggled at the beginning. He, and every one of them were going right hand towards the baseline. Yeah. Every single one of them. So it was a difficult fit for him. But overall, Clipson played really well. I thought defensively in the first half, if you take away free throw attempts, I think there was seven, they, Syracuse scored 17 or 19 points. I can't remember. It was 19. 19. 12 of which... We're free throws. Free throw line. I think they were 3 of 25 from the field at one point in the game. One of the best defensive performances I've ever seen. Now, given Syracuse doesn't run a ton of offense, but this bodes well against Georgia Tech because Georgia Tech last game, they were able to get a lot of open looks off penetration and kicks. Why? Because Clemson wasn't guarding the ball well. You're going to have to guard the ball well against Georgia Tech. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But I like the way this, this schedule's turning out. If you look behind me and I can get this thing going, I got the question mark there. There we go. Fly him in here. Georgia Tech's next. I like that schedule, Faxon. It doesn't look bad at all. Listen, I don't want to be like a homer, but <laughs> this could be a 6-1 and one stretch. And this could be a stretch where it provided Clemson gets a game on, the, on March 3rd. Um, especially if it's BC. I don't know if that game's ever getting rescheduled, but that would be seeing how they're playing. That would I be talked a to some guys, and it's still kind of up in the air as far as what they're going to do. But you've got to start with Georgia Tech. That's probably... To be honest with you, looking at it. That's the hardest game on the that's schedule. That's the hardest game left on the schedule. Unless Chris Likes decides to come back against Clemson at Clemson, which he has a propensity to do. So I'm not going to put that past him. But that's a very likable schedule. Notre Dame just had a good game. You have them next. But I mean, Tech, uh, it looks good. Like, you, you have to be paid. Yeah, we, we said at the beginning of the we year. We said at the we? beginning, yeah. Yeah, so they started. We, we were like, well, if we can get three or four wins in the first ten, I feel like Clemson's going to be okay. They end up five and five. What are they? Six and five right now? Yeah, six Starting and five. Start out five and five. Can't be much happier than that. And then you then you get the brunt of your schedule here. You hope to get Boston College on that March second and third. This is a favorable schedule. And like we we're just talking about earlier in the show as well, how crucial this Georgia Tech game is because if you can pick up this Georgia Tech game, that's three wins in a row, and you're in the driver's seat. You're seven and five and sitting fifth or sixth in the conference going into 
a bunch of bottom feeders of the conference. There's no other way to put it. These are some of the worst teams in the conference, bar pit. So if Clemson can handle their business on the road, and listen, I think that they're probably going to drop one of the three games. I don't think that they're going to go three and zero in that road stretch. It's difficult to win on the road in the ACC, but if Clemson can go two and one against those teams on the road and beat Georgia Tech, making it three and one in the next four. This is a team that we're going to have to start talking about could get back in the top 25 and maybe get a top five. Well, you're 10 and six then. Yeah, you're if 10. You, if, yeah. You, if you pick up three out of these four, you are, you are nine, nine and six. And six. Nine you're and six, nine and six me. with right. uh, Miami and then mystery matchup and Pitt pending. But yeah. nine and six in the conference with the out of conference schedule, you, Alabama's a top 10 team in the country. Purdue's a top 25 team in the country. FSU's a top, probably will get to the top 10. That's three really quality wins. And if you can get that, that record as good as you can in the ACC, this is a team that's going to, I think, could be ranked a lot higher Selection Sunday than most might think right now th- if they can handle their business. It's a big if. Projected as a 10 seed right now. I think that's disrespectful. No. I think that's disrespectful. Really? Yeah, I think that when you look at the resume. <laughs> Great the, job on the camera work, by the way. I the, have to say that. Uh, yeah, yeah, at the beginning <laughs> of the year, though, like this team was 9-1, and one, number 12 in the country. And personally, I'm viewing that. And, like, those three or four games where, you know, clubs had had some slip-ups, they got blown out, I'm viewing those as the outliers. I'm not viewing the good performances as the outliers. I'm trying to be an optimist. I think a 10 seed is disrespectful, and I think that Clemson will prove it in this stretch. I see 5-2 and two or 6-1. and one. That's tough. Yeah. It starts with Georgia Tech, though. Georgia Tech's tough. They, uh, now, you do kind of get, in the NBA, they call them scheduling losses to where you play a lot of minutes one game, then you have to go on the road the next. This is it. makes it difficult. This is a scheduling issue if you're Georgia Tech. If I'm Pastor, I'm not happy about it. But I'm pretty sure everybody gets one yeah. at some point during the year. Georgia Tech's well, good, though. I mean, Notre Dame just beat Duke. Yeah. You look at Clemson's, it might be that February 21st, February 23rd against Wake. If that game's on the 23rd, then that's that's a that's one day. you got to go from you got to go from Pennsylvania to North Carolina. So, what, like you said, one team gets every one of those. I wonder if they fly straight from Pitt to Wake. That'll be interesting to see. Yeah. I'm on the call for that Wake game. So I'll be driving up. Pulling through. Yeah, but uh, I, I, really like, I, I really like the way this is going around up. or shaping up. But Notre Dame's playing well. Yeah, that scares they me. They go to Duke and win. Now, that's not the same Duke as we've had in pre. I, that, that's, a, that's a given. However, it's still going there and winning. And Lejevsky's playing really well. Prentice Hub's starting to get his feet going. Jawan Durham's been good. Not very deep. And Cormac Ryan had an excellent game in Cameron Indoor. If Clemson plays lazy defense, Notre Dame will shoot them out of the building. It's as simple as that. If they play defense like they did in this game against Georgia Tech that we were going to recap, and they give them a bunch of open shots, Notre Dame's going to make you pay. But if they can come with the defensive intensity that they have, Notre Dame doesn't guard. We've seen this the entire year. They don't guard anyone. So Clemson will be able to get their points in this game. It's just, is the defensive intensity going to be there for 40 minutes? And can you limit Lejewski and some of the other great shooters that that team has? Well, Notre Dame has been playing a lot of zone, too. The thing that, the thing that worries me, if I'm Notre Dame, is sure you have some ancillary ball handlers, but Prentice Hub runs that team. Yeah. So if Clemson's able to really pressure the ball, get him tired, he's going to play 38, 40 minutes. I don't think there's any doubt uh, in, in anybody's mind that he's going to have to log those kind of minutes for Clemson to be successful because ball pressure for Clemson is too good. Pending you stay healthy. I think that's the biggest thing right now. You have to stay out of COVID protocols. I think that's a we, given. That was disastrous the first time it happened. That's the worst case scenario. We saw how much that affected the team. It looked like a completely different team post-COVID. And, and I went back and I watched the Georgia Tech game, and I was going to show some film from the last game of what they can do better. But the turnovers that they had, they ended up having 20 turnovers. They were just, I'm not, they were out of rhythm turnovers. They weren't terrible. Turn, they, they weren't turnovers that are going to continue to happen throughout the year. It's dribbling off foot. It's exposing the basketball. It's just stuff that you haven't been doing as the season goes along. Yeah, and GT came out in that weird 1-3-1 half-court trap as well. And I think Clemson had eight turnovers in the first eight minutes of that game. Yep. So they did do a better job of protecting the ball as the game went on. But at that point, Georgia Tech had already gotten it out of hand, um, hoping to see a different result come tomorrow. That game's tomorrow. That seems really soon. Yeah, really quick. But Clemson hasn't played since Saturday, so not quick for them, quick for Georgia Tech. Tech. Should be good for the Tigers. Next on the next on the slate, we gotta talk about Faxon's underrated slash mid major player of the week. And I love this guy. I'm gonna go ahead and slide it through. I love this guy. Might be one of my favorites. Had a big run a couple of years ago against or made it to the Final Four with Loyola Chicago. Look at this individual, son. Anybody with a mustache like that, you can get underrated player of the week any day. 100%. This week, got Cameron Crutwig. 
Um, 6'9", 255 from Loyola Chicago, we were talking about. You see over there in the accolades, helped lead Loyola Chicago to a Final Four appearance in 2017. In that Final Four game, as a freshman, he put up 17, tried to put the team on his back. Um, that year, he got uh, MVC Freshman of the Year, and then you can see his other accolades. He's been on the all-teams every single year of his career. This year, he's getting 15, 6, 3, playing some defense to efficient, scoring really efficiently, 60%. You cannot hold this guy in the paint. It's a simple right? Yeah, he's left-handed. Left-handed. But he can use both really well. An excellent passer. I'm, I'm shocked myself that he hasn't gotten Porter Moser a different job. I thought Porter Moser would be out of Loyola, Loyola Chicago, a long time ago. He must like that area. I'm yeah. not quite sure what's going on. But anybody with that mustache and that logo, I know Loyola Chicago. What's their? What's their? Uh, they're the. Was it the they're Racers? The, the Ramblers. The Ramblers. Yeah. And it's a, he looks like a one-man wolf pack. That's all I'm going to say about this guy. But an excellent passer, an excellent player. He's going to make some coin in Europe. You don't have to be overly athletic in Europe, but you have to be in good help side. You have to do some things like that. You don't have to jump out of the gym. Guys like this can make some coin. This is a good pick. I really like this player. He's been good for a, a, a lot of years. 15 and point per game for his career. This is like this isn't a breakout season by any means. He's been consistent the entire time. And he's not and he's not going to get less consistent because he's playing against higher competition. His game doesn't rely on that that athleticism. Like a lot of guys that turn pro, his game doesn't rely on that athleticism. He's skilled. He's skilled. He uses his body, his leverage, and because what is he 260, 255, 260? Yeah, 260. They're lying. He's 280. <laughs> like he's a big boy. He's a good player. Facts and that's a good pick. Hopefully they can get a win against Drake in their game coming up soon. That is going to kind of see how the MVC shakes up. And I think that Loyola Chicago, they're already ranked, just putting that out there. But, so they should get an at-large, but hopefully they can win their uh, tournament, make it easier. And we can see Cameron get back to another, maybe another Final Four, another Cinderella run, who knows. MVC, that's uh, Drake, it's their only quad one. quad one game of the season. If... Drake wins and Loyola wins the tournament. NBC is a too big lead. Too big. I, I don't think how you keep both of those teams out of the tournament. Quality teams, both riddled with shooters. Drake's really good, too. Yeah, they can definitely shoot it. They've covered the spread in almost every single one of their games as well. And they were on a magical undefeated run prior to, I think, a week ago. They ran into a buzzsaw in conference. But hopefully we get both of those teams in. That's the ideal situation. It's just, is the committee going to put some terrible Power 5 school in over them that would get ran out of the gym? Because yeah. that's what we usually see. Yeah, it's, it, it'll be interesting. The thing is, is if you put Loyola Chicago or Drake against a team with just athletes. Oh, they're going to beat them. They're going to win. I mean, yeah. that's what happened with Loyola Chicago a couple of years ago. Is They played Tennessee and Miami. Tennessee Miami, two great athletic teams, not necessarily the most skilled teams. Yeah. What happens? They take advantage. They got a, they got a, they got the moose inside the one man wolf pack, and then they throw it into him and they cut off of him. You're able to present a lot of different problems because a lot of Power Five schools don't play with a horse like that in the middle. Yep. So except for the Big Ten. Excuse and they me. don't and they don't see a lot of guys like this either. Like especially guys like the AC. There's not a lot of post centric teams. Everyone's either they're either shooting the three ball or they're looking to play through their wings. It's rare that in college basketball nowadays your best players are center. Yeah. You just don't see it. It's a matchup problem. It's a matchup problem. Good pick. Thank you. Good pick. Redeeming myself after last yeah, week. Yeah, last week you picked a draft pick. You can't do that. <laughs> Not for the underrated player of the week. No, it, look, NBC, Drake, Loyola Chicago, that's two teams that can make some. If they're a 12 seed, watch out because they can make some noise and they can get past definitely the first round. If you can shoot it, if you have somebody to play through, especially in the post with these mid-majors, they'll be okay. Faxon, nice job, sir. Thank you. Nice job. This weekend's games should be interesting enough. Saturday, Wake Forest at Florida State. That should be a blowout of epic proportions, but Wake Forest pulled one out at Boston College, and Forbes has got them playing really well defensively. I, could, I would be interested to see what the line is on that game. Um, Florida State's definitely going to win, but I think you might be able to get a Wake cover if it's in the double digits the spreads in the double digits. The only thing that worries me about when, when Wake, you, you haven't seen guys like Florida State has. Yeah, you haven't seen a Scotty Barnes. Yeah, so I'm curious to see what, what the spread is. I think that could definitely be interesting. But if that spread's 13 or 14, I'd, look, I'd lean towards taking Wake. Carter Witt's good. He never gets rattled. Of course, he's your age, Fax, and that's kind of the crazy part about it. Yeah. Yeah, he is a talented, uh, kind of a freshman. They're kind of, it's a free year, so he graduated high school early. He went to graduation December 19th, played for Wake, I think, on the 27th in their first game back from a long COVID pause. Wake Forest, 
they're going to make some noise. It's just going to take a little bit more time. But three wins in conference so far with seven to play. I mean, Wake Forest has outperformed everybody's expectation, including mine. Especially with like when you look at the talent that the, the roster has. Obviously, they have Wade and some other decent pieces, but we preach this every week about Wake. Once you get Steve Forbes, you let him recruit. You let him hit the transfer portal. This is a team that in two or three years could actually be very good, and you could see them return to somewhat of their, uh, you know, they used to have a reputation being a really good school, but maybe they could get back to that middle of the pack because – been a couple, really a couple down years in a row for them. But. They were really good when I was playing. Yeah, it they was. Were. Uh, was it Ish Smith? Yeah. Jeff Teague, Al Farouk Aminu, guy named Chaz McFarlane who was a nut, nutcase, L. D. Williams who was a good player, Ty Walker who was a McDonald's All American. They were really good. You can recruit at Wake. Yeah, you can. I mean, it's not one of those schools where you got to sit back and wait and see. Uh, you can go get those five star kids, and I think Forbes is going to get them because he's got that personality. He's pretty jovial. He turns it up at the right times. Knows how to motivate players. They, you can tell that they love playing for him. Yeah, and, and the effort level is really impressive. Florida State coming off a of COVID pause? Yeah, I mean, that game could get interesting. Like, <laughs> I, we said if the spread is like 12, 13, like, and like we've seen Wake have all these competitive losses too. Uh, is it at FSU? I think, yeah, it is at F- well, if it FSU. Was it, the only yeah. problem that I, that I see is FSU came back from a COVID pause earlier in the season oh, they, and looked phenomenal. They looked amazing. So I wonder how this is going to play out because it hasn't been a consistent theme. There's been other teams where they have had a COVID pause where they come back and they look great. And then the next time they come back and they're terrible. Cool. It should be an interesting game uh, to watch out for. Obviously, Florida State's going to win that no matter what. It would be upset. I, w- I would say ACC upset of the season if Wake was to go down there. Yeah. But watch for the spread on that one. That one should be interesting. Boston College at Syracuse. I would n- – no. I'm not picking Boston College ever <laughs> again in the history of the show. That, that, team is, that team is beyond dead. I don't see them winning another game in conference, just if I'm being objective. Uh, they have one conference win right now, and there's no path for them to get another one. That team doesn't guard anyone. They don't guard anyone, and what's been most disappointing is their guards just haven't played well. I expected their guards to be so much better. I was giving them the benefit of the doubt pretty consistently all season – They've been poor. I don't know how to say that differently. They've just been poor. They've been a letdown of a team as far as, like, we thought they would be on Wake's level, if that makes sense. Like, we thought they would be like, all right, you know, you can get three or four wins in the conference, maybe get up to five or six and uh, surprise some people. But that team's just been a letdown of epic proportions. I think uh, you might see a coaching change there in the, in the near future. I'm shocked because uh, I actually thought that they would compete in some games. They had Stefan Mitchell, who is a first-team all-defensive team member, and he does it all off hustle. But his hustle is not being reciprocated by the rest of the team. It's a really strange team to watch play. They try to play Rich Kelly. He's really not athletic enough to keep up with guys. He's okay offensively. But you need your guys to be guys. Winston Tabs, I I, I didn't even see him play last game, so I don't know what's going on. Jay Heath hasn't been able to hit shots at a consistent level. This Boston College team might have dug Jim Christian's grave, and I'm a little bit like, I, I, I'm curious if COVID's going to give him another break. Yeah. Because last season, I think it saved his job. Yeah. This season, I wonder if the patience level is going to be good enough up in Chestnut Hill. And no offense to the, uh, the Eagles, but uh, really hope Clemson can get that game scheduled. That, yeah. would be a, that would be a nice conference booster, you know, because uh, I think they would be coming to Little John as well in that hypothetical. Um, they were originally scheduled too. So hopefully uh, Clemson can get that game scheduled, get a nice little one to pad the resume. Yeah, it, it would be an advantageous thing to get Boston College to come down to uh, Clemson on the second and third, I believe. Yeah, that's second, third. Early. second uh, and third. Because it's the last game of the season on the fifth or sixth. That's right, that's right. Duke at NC State. This one's going to be interesting because Duke, if you finally just tell those guys to just go, don't think about it, just play, they could have a good game. But Duke's been poor, and it's at NC State in Raleigh. Here's the thing. NC State's played well at home. But it's crazy to think, about a month ago, we were talking about NC State being one of the best teams in conference. It was before Devin Daniels going down, and they actually looked really good against Clemson. Like, when you look at NC State's recent schedule, obviously they blew out BC, but they've been really down in form, and uh, they took Clemson to overtime. That's just crazy to think about that that was like three weeks ago that they took Clemson to overtime. Um, I'm going to pick NC State in this game um, because – I feel like in my lifetime, the, the amount of times Duke has gone to NC State and lost has been like five or six. I, I feel like it's like an every other year occurrence type thing. And I feel like, you know, they've just won big BC. Duke kind of a letdown at home. You could get the tail of two ends. You could get, okay, is NC State going to continue their good form and they're going to, you know, they're going to go and beat Duke? Or is Duke just going to give the I don't care mentality and go out there and play? I think this game's played in the 80s. I'm taking NC State. I'm going Duke. 
I don't think it's taking State, the talent. Yeah, I think uh, Matthew Hurt. They're going to put Man, they're going to put uh, Manny Bates on Matthew Hurt. I think he's going to be able to drag him away from the basket. Yeah. Now, if I was cutters. Keats, I would match him up against Jalen Johnson and be like, "Good luck, <laughs> just stay back." Yeah. But I think they're going to match him up against Matthew Hurt. That's not going to bode well for NC State because you're going to pull away your shot blocker away from the rim. It's going to be a lot of points in this game. A lot of points. A lot of points. That's why I'm picking Duke because they've showed that they can score points in the 90s. And without Devin Daniels, can NC State score in the 90s? Yeah, they're going to have to score a lot of points. I'm, I'm going to take NC State. I'm interested to see what the spread is on that game I, Like when it comes out. I think Duke's probably going to be favored by two or three if I had to just take a guess. Yeah, they're, they're continuously favored even when they're struggling. But I am going Duke on this one. So me and you, we, we went one and one last week. Yeah. I, who did we pick again? It was... You picked uh, NC State over Boston College. Yeah. And I... I took someone that beat Notre Dame. Who beat Notre Dame last was week? It Georgia Tech. It was Georgia Tech. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking there. But uh, yeah, so I'm taking then, Duke. You take NC State. And then Duke and bit us both last week against UNC. We we both picked Duke against UNC. Those were the three we picked. Caleb Love, coming alive. Yeah. We've talked about it. The heat, that team they is go in. as far. They go as far as Caleb Love takes them. Why? Because they have all the big guys. They need somebody who can get in that paint at will. Caleb Love can do that. He just hasn't played well up until that game. I think he's going to be better towards the end of the season. ACC tournament, dark horse, I'm telling you, Carolina might win it. Not looking forward to that and don't like hearing that coming out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I hope Carolina loses every game the rest of the season. All right, so Carolina at Virginia. I, this could get interesting. I think Carolina could win this game. I really do. And we're talking about points, points, points. Virginia had their best defensive showing of the season uh, last game against Georgia Tech. They held mm -hmm. them to 49. The offense, they kind of got bothered. They kind of got bothered on offense. They turned the ball over a ton, and if it wasn't for Kehi Clark hitting some three balls down the stretch, I think Georgia Tech could have gotten them in a weird low-scoring affair. No, I'm going to pick North Carolina, and I think that North Carolina is going to put up 80 in this game. Okay. I'm gonna that's, pick a, that's interesting. I'm going to go Virginia, and I'll tell you why. I think Virginia is going to be able to score at a high enough level. I think Sam Hauser was guarded by Alvarado against Georgia Tech. If that was a look weird at matchup. Matchup, But he did a great job. It took him a lot. He had four points. I want to say... Six or seven minutes left to go in the game. Alvarado was doing a fantastic job. This game, Hauser's going to pull those bigs away from the basket for Carolina. So who do you think is going to be the matchup for Hauser? Do you think they're going to put Baycott on him? Or do you, do you think they're going to put Baycott, a wing on him? Baycott, Baycott yeah. Yeah, Baycott, I think it's going to be him. I think it's going to be Garrison and Brooks. Brooks on uh, Huff. Yeah. It's going to be it's it's a tough matchup defensively for Carolina. And then if are, you, are, are you taking it back? No, I'm not going to take it back because I think that, <laughs> I think that like, Hauser's a okay defender, but I think that their size can overwhelm them if they can get Baycott and Brooks going inside. Jay Huff's a really good shot blocker. His help side can get suspect at times. If you move the ball around this Carolina defense, it, it, like I mean, we said it five minutes ago. If Caleb Love plays well, they can beat anyone in the country. So if Caleb Love can have a good game against Kehi. I'm assuming that's going to be the matchup. I'm going to take Caleb Love to get 15 to 20 points and Tar Heels maybe get some bench production from Leaky Black. Guys like that, get a win. Virginia, senior guards. North Carolina freshman. freshman guards. Yeah. Different style of play. Virginia's going to be able to slow them down. This and is they at might UVA. still score 80. This is at UVA. This is at UVA. Don't you do it. Can't I'm do not it gonna now. Change it. I'm not going to change it. <laughs> They're going to win. <laughs> All right. So win. I got Duke. You got North Carolina. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sunday's action. Pitt at Georgia Tech. Wow. They go they Wednesday, go back Friday. To back to yeah. Back? They go Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. That's, that's interesting. Give me Georgia Tech. At home. Yeah. I'm, that's a hard place to play. The pavilion's a hard place to play. And I'm, I'm going to try and say that I think Clemson's going to win tomorrow. So maybe that's a bounce back showing. Drop two in a row. Obviously, they're not going to be happy about that. Pitt doesn't play super well on the road. Um, so I'm going to trust Georgia Tech at home more than I trust Pitt on the road. I think that'll be a high scoring affair, though. You're, you're going to pick Pitt. I think so. I say three, three games in six days, that's tough. Eventually, the wheels are going to fall out. Now, the thing that scares me, if they lose to Clemson, then Georgia Tech will come back on Sunday ready to go. And they're playing for their season at that point. If Clemson wins tomorrow, that's why I'm picking Georgia Tech. If Clemson wins tomorrow, Georgia Tech is more than likely playing for a tournament bid that Sunday. That's how I view it, because they would have gone from 5-3 and three in the conference to 5-6. and six. They've still got those two catastrophic losses to Mercer and Georgia State at the beginning of the year. Kills them. So at that point, it's literally like every game is playing for their season. So... Mm -hmm. I think that if they have the back against the wall, Passer's going to have them ready to play. You know Alvarado and Moses Wright are going to go 35 regardless. You know DeVoe's going to play 35 minutes as well. I think that they're going to win that game. Champagne's going to get his, though. I'll take Pitt. 
All right, so I'm taking Pitt. I think Champagne is going to be too good for uh, Jordan Usher's been playing the four a lot for Georgia Tech. I yeah, don't think weird. he's a good. I don't think he's a good matchup for Champagne. Champagne is going to go for 30 and 15 again, like he's done all season. Xavier Johnson and Jose Alvarado might be the best two guards that nobody talks about. Yeah, because Xavier Johnson's really freaking good. He can ball, and he and he's able to get it in a a myriad of ways. Myriad of ways. Is that the right word? Myriad. That's yeah. probably the right word. Him getting into the paint, he's shifty off the ball. He's not going to turn it over that much. He's a junior guard. I like Pitt in this game, moving forward. Miami at Notre Dame, battle of the bottom. Notre Dame. I, I, this is my first time picking Notre Dame all year, but I know you're going to pick them, so I'm, I'm doing it as, like, I'm viewing in my head. I'm like, all right, we got three different already. Like, I can't be going crazy picking Miami on the road. Um, but it, in all honesty, it depends on if McGusty or Lyles are playing, which I'm going to guess they're not, as I haven't heard anything from the team about Chris likes timeline at this point, so um, I'm going to pick Notre Dame. They're playing good basketball right now, to their credit. They're, they're working their way back up. Yep. I like, uh, I like Notre Dame, too. They're playing well. They're shooting it really well. And Miami, I just don't think they're going to be able to guard well enough. They've lost too many players. McGusty likes. Cross transferred out. I, they're, they're a team that's reeling, and they've really struggled here in the early going. This could be a game where Wong gets 25, though, especially against that zone. If he's able to penetrate and get in the middle, he could get some easy buckets. But I think Notre Dame's offense is going to be too much. I just don't see anybody for Miami that can actually shoot the ball to spread that zone out. That's yeah. the thing that worries me about Miami now. Without likes, without cross, with Wong having to play the one. Like, he's, he's, he's doing a lot of heavy lifting. Yeah, so he I, don't, I don't like this Miami team basically for the rest of the year. I think they've been a disappointment dealing with injuries, obviously. A lot of different things going on. But Notre Dame at home, they're going to shoot the lights out against a team in Miami who doesn't guard well away from the house. Yeah. So. That'll be it. Next, you got Georgia Tech. This is, let me, get, let, me, let me pull up their stuff here. Bang. Georgia Tech. Josh Pastner's fifth season. I love Georgia Tech. Josh Pastner has the best haircut in the Atlanta Coast Conference. I don't know that there's a second place, Faxon. I don't know that there's a second place. He looks like Starsky and Hutch. Ben Stiller's character on Starsky and Hutch with the super curly hair, sideburns down to his jaw, fires me all the way up. Pastner's coaching a pretty good team. We've talked about him already. Is a team that can score in bunches. They've got a lot of weapons, just not very deep. Alvarado played 40 minutes, and he was guarding Hauser the entire time. So that means he's putting more weight on his body, banging in the post, doing a lot of different things. Georgia Tech, this is a great way for Clemson to keep that ACC momentum moving forward. This is such a massive game. It's making me nervous just thinking about it, and especially considering the result last time we played Georgia Tech. But as we've said before, a lot of the stuff against Georgia Tech last matchup was self-inflicted and fixable. So um, when you look at Georgia Tech, I mean, we play these guys twice every year. It seems like at this point this is three years in a row where we've gotten them twice. Um, last game, they shot the absolute lights out. DeVoe shot 6-6 six six from three. Alvarado actually got hurt in the middle of the game, and they still blew us out. Don't know how encouraging that is. <laughs> Moses Wright is really the X factor. Um, I think he had close to 20-10 and 10 last time uh, these teams faced off. So if, keep Moses Wright in check. You know Alvarado and DeVoe are going to get their 15. You know they're going to get their 20. Just keep, don't let Moses Wright do what he did at the beginning of the last game, which was I think he had the first 12 points of the game for GT. Well, well, they have 20 turnovers last game. You have the stats. They were giving them free buckets. Yeah, they, they were 20 free, turnovers. Yeah, free buckets. Clemson had a hard time guarding. Once they got them in a the half court, they actually didn't do a bad job. And offensively, Clemson did a great job as far as shooting percentages are concerned. But also, a lot of turnovers that were just bad. Usher had 21 against Clemson. I don't see that happening again. I think that's a once-in-a-lifetime type thing. Like, this dude was bombing in threes from the hash. He shot five of eight from three. And, he was, put, and he was shooting them quick, too. The, yeah. These weren't within the flow of the offense. No, there it, were a lot of turnovers. They were, to be honest with you, they just looked out of sorts this game. Going yeah. back and watching, there, were turn, there, was a PJ, there was a P.J. Hall turnover where he just put the ball in front of him. Moses Wright reaches down and gets it. This was not a Clemson team that was engaged back to their playing form yet. I think coming back home, with Georgia Tech having to play some serious minutes, that's going to bode well for the Tigers. I like, I like Clemson in this game just because GT just played a hard game against Virginia. Virginia has a way. There's a little bit of the Clemson football effect to Virginia basketball and that the next game after you, you play down. Virginia, you're done. You're exhausted. So I think that's a big thing. But turnovers offensively key. Clemson can get good shots against this Georgia Tech team. You yep. just can't give them easy runs at the basket. And we, shot, we saw them shoot 52% from the field. Uh, it was 25 for 48. And then shot, uh, also saw them shoot 50% from three, 9 of 18. When they were actually taking care of the ball and they were within the flow of the offense, like you said, they were getting good and open shots. It's just, can you take, take care of the ball, 
you can't give these guys free possessions to run out and transition and have Jordan Usher bombing a bunch of threes on you because a lot of DeVoe's threes were in transition as well. They were mm -hmm. just running down to the corner in transition. No one's picking them up, and you're leaving the best shooter on the court wide open in the corner. Can't and because they were guarding in transition, they had a hard time uh, basically rotating because they were having a hard enough time match up. It, it was a really tough game for them when they weren't able to set up their defense. Now, Georgia Tech runs a lot of different stuff at you. They'll throw some 1-3-1. One, one. It'll be a 2-3. It'll be an inverted 2-3 where they bring the wings up really high. They mix up some different zones. It's not the same zone. They're they well coached. Done. They're well coached, especially defensively because they're so small. Moses Wright plays the five the majority of the time. They try to put, uh, was it Rodney, uh, what's the guy's name? Rodney Howard in the game transfer from Georgia. He's not ready yet. They play seven deep. Really five deep because five guys play more than 30 minutes. That's tough. Yeah, man. I'm looking at Moses Wright from this last game. He had 21, added four rebounds, three assists, two steals, and two blocks. He was all over the floor all night. All over the floor all night. So if, if the Tigers can shut down Moses Wright, and I feel like a lot of that would be doing defronting him in the post. I feel like that would be a good idea, letting the help side help out. I think this could be a successful night for the Tigers. I don't see Usher going for 21. That's just not going to happen. Yeah. That, that's a big point. You see my, my, my court here. Yeah. Another point is you got to guard them with hands up. There yeah. were so many threes, and we're talking deep threes down at Georgia Tech. Ram and Rec, they were shooting them for all over the place, and they're Ridiculous. doing it off of basically pick plays where the Tigers just don't have their hands up. Defensively, you have to at least put a hand up the entire time. DeVoe hit them from out here. I think Alvarado hit a couple out there. It was kind of nuts all the way around. They play really well, but I really think that Clemson's going to be able to get some momentum if they don't turn the ball over and play well. So that's that. Another thing, Clemson struggled with last game, and I didn't notice with strong side help. Do you know what strong side help is? I'm sure yeah. you do. Yeah. A lot of the people watching, strong side help for the Tigers. A lot of times, Virginia Tech will end up here. Let me pull that back up. I just messed everything up. They will end up out here with DeVoe. And they will have Usher here, and then we'll have one, two. They'll try to set a ball screen with three. This guy will get downhill here, and this guy will help over here. That is way too easy of a pass. Yeah. That corner three, they hit four of them last game. And we saw the last game a, a lot, too. It was Alvarado to DeVoe in the corner. I think DeVoe had four corner threes last game. He was just like, you're leaving the best shooter on the court wide open because you're over-helping. Let the center come down and help you with that. Let the power forward come from the weak side. You can't, can't over-pursue and leave the corners wide open. You're just giving them easy shots. Yeah, and whenever they do come over to set a ball screen, you have to make this guy right there, the D, right there. You have to make him, whenever they come to set a screen, you have to make him go this direction. Because if you don't, there's no help down there until this guy has to come all the way over and you're giving... You're getting a shot here, you're getting a shot here. Wherever that help comes from, you're creating all kinds of disadvantages. It's going to be, it's going to be tough all the way around. I, I, I think like Clemson needs to do a really good job of staying in front, making them use ball screens. And on top of that, you can't let Georgia Tech go back door because they run a lot of Princeton action, keep them in front of you, contest with a hand up, play on the ball defense at a high level and don't turn it over. You're going to be okay. Yeah, and I think that I'm hoping, like, just as a fan perspective, I'm hoping that the fatigue plays a role because, like, it seems like these guys are just always ready to go, 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 especially Alvarado and DeVoe. It seems like they never run out of energy. That goes for Bubba Parman as well. Um, last game against Clemson, you can look. Moses Wright played 38 minutes. It's just ridiculous. They play, like, they play five guys 30-plus minutes, and then they play only two guys really consistently off the bench. Can I, can I just call it what it is? With yeah. it, it's a manhood game for Amir Sims. Oh, this yeah. is a game where Moses Wright got the better of you last time. You're big and strong enough to be able to hold him out. He absolutely dominated in the paint. Not just against Amir, but Amir is your go-to player. He's your leader. He's got to have a good game. He's going to have to get him in foul trouble because if he gets in foul trouble, Jordan Tech's really in trouble. You're going to have to find other ways to get right around the rim. Yeah, and we were talking about Georgia Tech's lack of depth. Like, So if you do get him in foul trouble – you're going to have to be playing guys you're not comfortable playing with. And Pastner, obviously, if Pastner had trust in these guys, they would be playing. It's really just as simple as that. If Pastner trusted these, these freshmen and sophomores and transfers to come in off the bench, give them quality minutes in the conference, they would be playing and they're not playing. So they only played two guys off the bench last game, and it was 14 and 11 minutes, respectively. Yeah, and Georgia Tech will play this funky kind of zone where they will put these wings up high here and here. They play them way high. Clemson needs to take advantage of these spots. It could, this is OMAX territory. OMAX territory. You get in that little 15-foot range. This pass from here, you have one from one to five or one to four. 
those passes are going to be open. So you have to take advantage of that. They like to get those wings really high. And with some recent rotation changes we've seen, when you look just even a month ago against Georgia Tech, Omax Prosper played one minute in that game, and it was at the very end. Jonathan Bear played 18. How do you think that those two's minutes are going to shake up, especially because we saw how well Omax played on the baseline last game, and we're talking about a team that does feature some zone looks on defense. You think that, because oh, I, I personally think that Omax is going to play more than Bear in this game after there being a 17-minute discrepancy the last time they played. The only difference is I think Bear guards so much better than Omax at this point, especially yeah. on the ball. You're going to need him. But to, to you're absolutely right. Moses. If he's able to, if he's able to get him, if he's able to get that ball on those short corners, it's going to be where he dominated he's last He's really game. good, and he and he's good enough shooter to knock those down. And he's got a little more girth to him than uh, Jonathan Bear does. But Jonathan Bear, he knocked down a couple. Yeah, not a bad get, not a bad game to play Syracuse right before Georgia Tech. They kind of show some of the same things. Things bringing like the nature. wings up. Yeah, bringing the wings up exactly like I talked about. Look, good game for Clemson. Momentum game for Clemson. I think they should be able to pull out a wing pen, win, pending they don't turn it over, pending they bring the energy on defense. Do we have any questions? Uh, we do not. Well, we have a question of earlier in the show. It was about Jonathan Bear, but he said that Coach Brad Brown made the correct call using Amir in the high post. I mean, we could segue that into a question. Do you think Amir is going to be featured in the high post against zone looks again, which I say would be a yes. He's the best facilitator on the team. I would imagine yes, but they do play those people high in the middle. Yeah, it's So it's a different zone. So a, like A lot of the times Amir, last time against Georgia Tech, was catching the ball at almost the three-point line coming out. Like He would be getting, like, Moses Wright would be pushing him so far out that he would be almost at the three-point line like most of the time outside of the free throw line to catch the ball and then you look and you got the wings pressed so far up and if no one's open back door like created a lot of opportunities for Amir to take Moses right one-on-one -on -one. and I did not feel like Amir played great on defense last time these guys matched up but I did feel like he had a pretty decent offensive game he got the best to right as far as scoring the basketball he went he went 9 of 13 from the field for 19 points look for Clyde to get up there in the middle too I yeah. think you, you can run Bear across that baseline from 15 to 15 sometimes out to the corner three look for Clyde to get in the middle because he's such a good passer and uh, you're going to have to hit some shots, and you're going to have to hit them deep whenever Georgia Tech plays those zones. But just get a shot up. Don't necessarily worry so much about turnovers. Just get a shot up. Yeah. Should be good. Are and then we, we had go? another question coming from okay. Twitter earlier from Phillips Geis. He said, I know you're going to talk about it, but what adjustments do you expect defensively from the Tigers following the first matchup from GT? I think if they just guard the ball and they don't turn it over, they don't get put in bad situations. I don't think they guarded that bad. You can't, you can't help from the strong side. That's a big thing. But other than that, Clemson actually defended okay. They were just out of sorts. They were a little bit out of rhythm. It was just a – I'm telling you, the COVID pause was super evident against that. Now, Virginia, I knew that was going to be bad because, like, who do you not want to play for coming back from a COVID pause? Virginia. Because you know they're going to be prepared. They're going to be so prepared, it's ridiculous. Yeah, so then you get beaten down, and then you have to go to a tough place to play in Atlanta, and then they were able to shoot the ball well. And they really – hurt themselves because they turned it over so much, but they shot it well and they were able to get good shots. These weren't fluke shots that they were getting. They're going to be able to get good shots and they better not turn it over. And if their defense is going to be good, I like Clemson's chances. Friday, tomorrow, lone game in the ACC. Clemson will play Georgia Tech. I believe it. the start time is at 7 on RSN. So a lot of you that get blacked out for uh, cable reasons, I, I have been blacked out several times this year. I'm going to find a way to get that game. I'll be doing it on Twitter. I'll be typing it up. I'll do my best to put the scores up there just to make sure that everybody gets their information correct. So, anyway, that is Beyond 22 Basketball. Thank you so much for attending. We only got a few weeks left in the season. I think it's been good so far. And uh, we will see you next week. Georgia Tech, Notre Dame. We'll have some more to talk about. Still experimenting with this thing. We're in February. Experimenting anyway. Always trying to get better and show you different things. So, thank you so much for attending. For Facts and Childers, I'm Terrence Oglesby, and we'll see you next time.